I could see that the raw resource was starting to run out and it just happened that at about that time I took a plane trip over our place and uh, had a good look at it from the air, did quite a few circuits around it and the salinity was obvious from the uh, air much more than what I thought even though I'd been plodding around on the ground uh, every day of my life there. I knew it was there, but when I got above it and saw what a scar it was across our farm, it was uh, by far the worst uh, feature that I could see from up there. That's when I uh, came down and started to fence out the, uh, the gullies. I think it has come out, well, in my view, with all the work that's been going on, especially with Langhead groups and the potter, is to have an aerial photograph of your farm. You, know, you can't do anything until you have your aerial photograph. And that points out everything. That's where all the old existing trees are, where all the old, where the drainage lines are, and all the existing fences are on it. So that's your, your starting point, is your, is your farm plan. It really and it certainly helps you, encourages you once you see your farm on a, on a large uh, photograph, you're, you're off and away, really. It really gives you an idea of what your farm looks like. The aerial mm. photograph gives you that. I think combination of aerial photograph, farmer himself, and also consultants. I think it's good if they can work with a consultant one to one or go through uh, farm plan short courses. An individual farmer is likely to come up with a better plan working with aerial photograph, with consultants, with other farmers than he would if he just tackled the whole thing on his own. In most cases, some people <coughs> are capable of that. Planning requires the ability to step back from your farm business and take an objective look at it and its resources. The truth is that many farmers are continually planning and replanning their places. And the idea of whole farm planning is nearly as old as the hills. But that planning usually takes place in their heads. And as one guy admitted to me, that's a pretty silly place to leave it. Now, the planning process you're about to see has no magic secrets or quick fixes. It's been developed by the farmers and the project managers through their years of experimenting on the demonstration farms. Often they disagreed or used opposite methods. We're not as concerned about who was right as much as whether it was right for that farm and that farmer. He's the one who knows his farm better than anyone else. It's his business and he'll have to put the time and the money into the changes. If there's a commitment to planning, the first thing is to get an aerial photograph. It costs usually around about $100 and can be organised in most states through the lands office. The ideal scale is one metre in 5,000. That's for 750 hectare farms and under. And one metre in 10,000 for larger places. Mount the photograph on a solid backing in a frame with three clear overlays attached, which cover the photo and can be drawn over and can also be folded out of the way. You might also find that several copies of the photo can be handy for field work and roughing out ideas. As you progress through each stage, the plan will develop to highlight the siting of the farm's management units, according to land types, the access system around the property, a water strategy to match production needs with the flow of water around the place, a natural vegetation system to enhance production, a pasture and crop strategy with a target of more sustainable yields and continuing benefits to the soil system. The first step in the farm plan is to redesign the paddocks, or the management units as the potter people call them, according to land types. Different land types respond differently to cultivation. They respond differently in seed emergence, to fertilisers and sprays, and they all grow different weeds. On top of this, they respond differently to grazing, in drainage and fertility, and have varying soil structure and organic matter. If the management is not attuned to these differences, both production and the land's capability lose out. It was very important on our, our farm, I felt, to fence to the uh, different land types. And so we fenced out each management uh, parcel so that I could look after them, the solely gullies, so I barely want to exclude uh, 
sheep in the winter, but I wanted to leave sufficient growth there during the summer to uh, uh, so that there wasn't too much evaporation of the water leaving the salt behind. So I fenced to whatever that uh, dictated. Totally ignored the uh, fences that were there already. And uh, now I've got uh, some crazy sharp paddocks. In fact, I haven't got uh, a paddock now that's uh, square or rectangular. They're any shape. To prepare the first overlay, draw in the natural features of your property. Watercourses. Drainage line. Ridge lines. The vegetation and the soil types. From this point, draw in the different land types. Now, obviously, you'll have to check them, but as a guide, land types can be divided into these categories. Different soils, where soils of different capabilities exist on the one property. Different aspects of the land, north or south facing. The slope of the land, flat, undulating or steep. Drainage, and of course, vegetation. By identifying these features, a picture of the different land types on your farm emerges. The broader the land types, the better at this stage. Of course, dividing your farm into land types is nothing new. The soil conservation authorities have been doing this for 50 years or more. The difference with the Potter farmland plan is that the farmer, not the soil conservation specialist, identifies the land types even to the extent that the demonstration farmers named each land type, such as heavy black country, light sandy ridges, salty flats, and so on. By pinpointing these features, a broad picture of the different land types in your place emerges. This is how Bruce Milne approached it. Uh, we had low, wet, salty areas. We had high, dry, sandy areas. Uh, we had low, wet, but not salty areas. Um, our farm isn't deeply dissected, so we didn't have many ridge lines or rocky outcrops, but they can be uh, areas on other farms that need addressing. Uh, we unfortunately didn't have many areas of remnant vegetation left on our farm, so we couldn't uh, delineate them. And any trouble spots on the farm may affect the overall plan, and so should be marked in. We needed to address our poor our ailing soils, for example, acidity, compaction, erosion, salinity. And we can't do that unless we've got those areas packaged out. Try to consider a particular area's performance in different conditions. Also, areas hard to manage, like steep land, rocky land or pothole land, boggy areas or waterlogged sections. Parts of the property prone to hazards, like fire, drought and the wind hazards, taking heed of their direction for shelter and protection. This is now the base map of your property and so you should be able to answer any question that pops up as you develop a new plan. The next move is to draw in the existing layout of your farm on a new plastic overlay. This includes the present fence lines which often show up on the photo. All gates, roads and laneways, yards, buildings, water supplies, power lines, pipelines and cables. Not all the information can be recorded on the plan. You'll need a separate journal which becomes an invaluable resource anyway. The present use or uses for each paddock can be listed as well as the age and the condition of the fences. Also planning constraints such as land tenure or partnerships should be noted. And as we think about these needs, uh, we, can, we can easily, with a pen on paper, juggle our plan a little bit, uh, so that if the, we may need to make just a minor compromise between where a fence was and where, we, and where we need it for the future. But it's easy to do that with a pen on the, on the map, rather than put a fence in the wrong place and then go and pull it out again. Having got the existing layout done, we begin a totally new one. And the first principle in this exercise 
is to completely ignore the press and fence lines. They're recorded only to plan the changes when your new layout is completed. One of the hardest things to do is to take the existing fencing framework from your mind for a moment as you look at the aerial photograph and think about the essentially different management areas on our farm. Our farm wasn't too complicated, fortunately, and many aren't. We had to think about the essentially different management area down our salty drainage outlets, for example, on our farm. It covered about 10% of our farm. Uh, in the southwest corner, we had it up out of the drainage line, but still a low, wet, basin-shaped paddock, which needed better drainage. So we needed to fence that out and manage it according to its capacity to produce into the future, to sustain production. That's what we had to think about for each management group on our farm. We broke our farm up into about five essential management areas. To begin the layout, base the new units or paddocks on the natural boundaries of land types, as marked in on the base map. These land type divisions form the basis of the new fence line plan. As much as possible, try to restrict the units to the one land type, as long as it's a practical size for the operation. As, when we look back, the, uh, the planning process as it evolved was a pretty simple one of, of looking at your land types and sorting those out, then coming up with a, yeah. a farm layout that reflected that, and then sorting out management within each of those. And it's, it's a lot easier to say than do when you're starting out the first time, I suppose. Yeah. Remember when Peter Waldron came up with a laneway which uh, showed that he'd completely disregarded his existing layout and, and, and he had actually put up those fences himself and his father, so he'd, he was uh, sending a lot of hard work. Taking uh, a completely fresh look at the whole exercise. Looking at the basic resource, the different land types, coming up with a layout that reflects that. But all needs, within be, that. all needs to be done from the aerial photograph as the base, though. Yeah, and uh, within each of those land types, uh, getting some diversity across the yep. farm enterprise and also looking after the basic ecology of the land, so water courses and indigenous vegetation <coughs> and, and a network of... And taking into account the actual enterprise that's run, whether it be sheep or cattle or cropping or whatever. Try to restrict the units to the one land type as long as the sizes suit the enterprise for that unit. For cropping operations, fencing these new subdivisions might be impractical but the boundary of the land type best be recorded to ensure that each type is managed according to its particular characteristics. The land types determine the appropriate method of tillage. And remember that the size of the units must cater for the machinery that will be used. Avoid sharp angles in the corners of a unit. If there are heavy soils on cropland unsuitable for crop growth, consider a tree clump for wood, for wildlife and wind and water control. Gates should be on higher and stable soils where stock will move naturally. Alternatively, unstable surfaces can be stabilised to avoid creating erosion hazards and muddy gateways where disease can build up and spread. On large scale operations, knowing your land types is still very important. Stock can be encouraged to graze to the land's capability through careful placement of water tanks, feed supplements and shade or shelter. For many people, changing the existing layout is a real wrench. After all, they've grown up with the paddocks and the fence lines the way they are. But most properties were originally designed according to a grid or land title and the compass. They certainly weren't designed according to the natural characteristics of the land. This unit arrangement incorporates much of the existing fence and stands as a guide to the farm's long-term redevelopment, perhaps 10 or 20 years hence. Now, this plan is not complete, and there are still a number of components to come. Access and a water management strategy, natural vegetation, and pasture and crop strategies. And while it's only lines on a bit of plastic, it really is an important blueprint for your farm business. It'll take a lot of time and a number of heads to get it to the stage where you can implement it. And that can mean involving the whole family. And it was an extremely satisfying time for me because it, just to be able to see the, an actual plan on paper turn into trees and fences and pasture 
on the actual farm. And also, as a family, it, it pointed out to us how complicated the actual environment is on our farm and how little we know about it and how we can help each other learn more about it in the future. And finally, I think it's given Robert and I, who'll be the next generation to farm this, this farm, a great foundation to build on in the future so that we can keep on farming on a, on a healthy farm and keep on producing well into the future. You can just have a bit of a play around and see what you come up with. As if you're happy with it, we can go ahead with it. If you don't like something, you have a clear overlay, you can just rub it out and start again. And you just, it's just a matter of having a bit of a play around and see what you come up with. And go go out and uh, see if it fits the land then, see what it looks yeah. like out there, yeah. see whether it's, it's going to fit the stock movements. That's right. We had a lot of fun and uh, did a lot of maps before we came up with what we thought <laughs> were right because we had to develop the processes that we thought were necessary to, to uh, make a farm plan, didn't we? So we're not suggesting to move the fence immediately, the plan's drawn up or immediately you go out to do the work. But if it's on the plan, it can be done when that fence needs replacing. In years gone by, people who were interested in planting trees generally put another fence beside an existing fence and put in a plantation. But what we're saying is that's not necessarily the right place for that plantation. Perhaps you should be waiting until that fence needs replacing, or if you can afford it, shift it, um, because a fence can be shifted and reused, and put the, put the plantation where it should be, or where you think it should be, according to your, your new farm plan. And once you do that, that gives you a new idea. Yeah. You can say, oh, I hadn't thought of that before, but by putting that fence there, I can you know, redirect stock around this way and it'll, it'll be much easier. It does alter things, and that comes mm. into the, the planning mm. process, doesn't mm. it? Yeah, some, sometimes you'll do something and it does alter mm. uh, something somewhere else. So you've got to be flexible. Mm. I think ours is into their 19th edition in five years. <laughs> 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 They've been minor, uh, minor fine-tuning uh, towards the finish, yes. Yeah.